if you've listened to Andrew Huberman's podcast, then you've heard often that he strongly advises against using melatonin because of its potential side effects. I never suggest melatonin for sleep. Generally, I do think that Huberman is a great source of information, but there are some conflicting studies and conflicts of interests in regards to what he says about melatonin specifically. In this video, I'm going to cover the things Huberman leaves out when he's talking about melatonin, and we'll see if his own sleep supplement stack is as good as he says it is. I'm the party pooper. I'll be covering the side effects of melatonin shortly, but first let's address the main reason why someone would take melatonin, sleep. On the Joe Rogan podcast, Huberman said that melatonin helps you fall asleep, but it won't help you stay asleep. The problem with melatonin is it will help you fall asleep, but it won't help you stay asleep. And so some people have this problem, they take melatonin, they fall asleep, and then they wake up three or four hours later. it wears off. However, there's a plethora of peer-reviewed clinical trials and meta-analyses showing how melatonin supplementation improves not only sleep latency, the time it takes for you to fall asleep, but also increases total sleep duration and sleep quality. Melatonin use has been seen to improve sleep in patients of brain disorders like Alzheimer's disease and psychiatric or mood disorders. In terms of sleep awakenings, there are some studies finding that melatonin does reduce the amount of time people wake up during sleep, whereas others find no difference. There are no studies that I could find that would show that taking melatonin would actually make you wake up more often during the night. A review of 23 studies among people with sleep disorders found that melatonin actually decreased sleep disturbances while increasing total sleep time and quality. So the evidence indicating melatonin and sleep quality and sleep disturbances and sleep awakenings is generally actually either neutral to positive instead of neutral to negative. Of course, some people might subjectively wake up during the night after they take melatonin, but the totality of evidence suggests that this is not really a significant effect. Instead of melatonin, Andrew Huberman says on Joe Rogan that, yeah, there are much better things for sleep. My favorite sleep cocktail based on really good, solid peer reviewed science is magnesium threonate and something called apigenin, which is basically a derivative of chamomile. Coincidentally, these are the ingredients in the Huberman sleep stack sold by Momentus Labs. Momentus is a sponsor for Huberman's podcast, and I'm sure he has some sort of a deal with the company because it's his recommended stack for sleep. Now, that's fine by itself. Different influencers and even scientists, they're allowed to have sponsors, and they're allowed to do sponsorship deals, etc. And they're allowed to create their own formulations and different kinds of stacks in terms of different supplementation. The problem is this bundle costs a whopping 175 euros for only a 60 serving supply. When you go to Amazon or any other store, you could get a 180 day supply of melatonin for only 5 to 15 euros. One serving of the Huberman sleep stack costs around 3 euros, whereas one serving of melatonin costs around 5 cents. That's a 60 times difference. It is true, as Huberman often points out, that many commercial melatonin brands can have anywhere from 80 to 470% different amounts of melatonin than the label says. If you take pharmaceutical grade melatonin, then you're going to get exactly what the label says, which is why I would recommend you try to get pharma melatonin if you ever do take melatonin to get the exact amount. But let's say it is the case that you take a regular commercial melatonin, you think you're taking one milligram, for example, but the actual ingredient or the actual amount is 400% more, so four milligrams instead of the one milligram per serving, then you're only going to get four milligrams of melatonin instead of one milligram. If the label says 0.1 milligram, which is a low dose of melatonin, but you end up getting 400% more, then you're still going to end up getting only 0.4 milligrams of melatonin, which is very within the safe and pretty normal range. Taking even up to 50 milligrams of melatonin hasn't been seen to change natural melatonin production. However, melatonin in doses of 75 milligrams has been used as an oral contraceptive. But even then, if you take 10 milligrams of melatonin and the bottle actually has 400% more, then you'll end up getting only 40 milligrams of melatonin. I do understand Andrew Huberman's caution because he's a professor and obviously he doesn't want to just recommend publicly different kinds of supplements, especially hormones. But he does make it seem that melatonin is somehow inherently dangerous to your health and is going to actually make your sleep worse. While under the table he's promoting his 175 euro alternative to a generally considered as safe and extremely cheap over-the-counter supplement, which is melatonin. But do the ingredients in his own sleep stack actually have any benefits for sleep? Let's look at that. Animal studies have found that magnesium threonate is more effective in raising brain magnesium levels than other forms of magnesium. But magnesium threonate is the most expensive 
expensive form of magnesium, and any form of magnesium is generally sufficient to raise your body's magnesium status. A 2022 review on magnesium and sleep concluded that observational studies suggest an association between magnesium status and sleep quality. However, the randomized control trials find conflicting results. A 2021 systematic review and meta-analysis found that oral magnesium supplementation could improve total sleep time by 16.6 minutes, but it's statistically insignificant. Whether or not you should take magnesium 3 and 8, I guess, depends on your budget and whether or not you're trying to target the brain specifically. But there's nothing magical about magnesium 3 and 8 when it comes to sleep. I would personally use just regular magnesium bisglycinate because it's cheaper, it has one of the best bioavailability, and it has attached glycine, which is an amino acid, with a lot more evidence for improving sleep and relaxation. Next up, we have apigenin, which is a flavonoid that's found in some foods as well as chamomile. A 2011 randomized placebo-controlled pilot study found that chamomile flower extract with over 2.5 milligrams of apigenin resulted in no differences in total sleep time, sleep efficiency, sleep latency, sleep quality, and number of awakenings between the groups. A 2019 systematic review and meta analysis of randomized trials and quasi-randomized trials show that chamomile appears to be safe and effective for sleep quality, but there's little to no evidence on insomnia. L-theanine is an amino acid that you can get from tea, and it's said to have a calming anxiolytic effect. There are very few studies showing that L-theanine improves sleep quality or sleep duration. A mixture of GABA and L-theanine has been seen to decrease sleep latency and improve NREM sleep in rats, but there's no evidence in humans. Theanine has been seen to reduce stress and anxiety scores, but also reduce sleep quality scores, with people taking L-theanine reporting greater sleep disturbance and sleep latency. So it appears that L-theanine might have a total net negative on sleep. And lastly, inositol is a carbocyclic sugar that is most known for its insulin sensitizing effects, but is also involved with neurotransmitter production. A 2022 randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study on pregnant women did find that taking 2 grams of inositol for 14 weeks improved total sleep quality and sleep duration. Low frontal cortex myo-inositol levels appear to be associated with sleep disturbance. So inositol does appear to have some effects on sleep, but whether or not it's better than melatonin or something else is not clear. Overall, I think that these compounds themselves are pretty good, but I don't take these for sleep because there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that these compounds themselves are really good for improving sleep quality. They might help some people by raising their magnesium status or reducing stress and anxiety, but there's little to no evidence that they're better than melatonin in terms of sleep. It's a trap. Now, the biggest warning sign Huberman attaches to melatonin has to do with how it might negatively affect puberty and hormonal development. The reason kids don't go into puberty until a certain age is because they have chronically high melatonin. Really? Melatonin suppresses puberty. So when I hear about people taking a lot of melatonin and you've got this whole issue with falling testosterone, dysregulated estrogen in men and women. Yes, it is true that melatonin levels can affect pubertal development. When you're a child, you produce a lot of melatonin, and after puberty, melatonin levels begin to significantly decrease. Melatonin levels reach their lowest in elderhood, which begins to affect sleep quality and sleep duration. Elderly people sleep significantly less because of not producing that much melatonin. Huberman's theory is that taking melatonin, at least in children, will postpone puberty and have a negative effect on sexual development. A 2021 study on children with autism found that taking melatonin for two years was safe and there were, quote, no observed detrimental effects on children's growth and pubertal development and no withdrawal or safety issues related to the use or discontinuation of the drug. Another 2011 study on regular Dutch children saw that taking on average 2.69 milligrams of melatonin for on average 3.1 years resulted in no differences in pubertal development and overall health scores. However, there is a study on 7 to 10 years of melatonin use among adolescents with chronic sleep onset insomnia, where 31.3% of the participants reported late perceived pubertal timing compared to the 17% of the control group. Because this is not a randomized clinical trial, the authors of the study concluded that it's not possible to conclusively say that the slightly higher rate of delayed puberty among the melatonin users was specifically because of using melatonin. I personally wouldn't take melatonin at least until I'm 20 years old. Your body already produces enough melatonin and any sleep disturbance at that age is primarily environmental or lifestyle related. 
Artificial light exposure at night is a known disruptor of sleep and melatonin production. The blue and green light from tech screens and smartphones suppresses melatonin production almost entirely, and no wonder you can't fall asleep. Instead of taking melatonin, you want to use blue blocking glasses, which have been seen to improve sleep quality in studies, as well as dim down the lights before bed. For adults, the fear Huberman has about melatonin is that it's going to negatively affect sex hormones like testosterone. It's been found that melatonin doesn't alter gondotropin and testosterone levels, but it does increase prolactin levels. Prolactin is a protein with the main role of enabling mammals to produce milk, but it also has an important role in the metabolism and immune system. Physiological levels of prolactin help with testosterone secretion and spermatogenesis. Low prolactin levels are linked to poor sperm motility and hypoandrogenism. However, excessively high prolactin levels might promote low testosterone, male breast development, and sexual dysfunction. There is a positive relationship between nocturnal concentrations of melatonin and prolactin, and taking melatonin increases prolactin levels in young men. So there is the theoretical risk that melatonin use could lower your testosterone levels and cause sexual dysfunction through increasing prolactin. However, a 2022 study on US adults found that low-dose melatonin supplementation wasn't associated with low total testosterone levels, but a higher BMI and older age were. Another 2023 study on US adults saw no association between using melatonin within the past 30 days and low testosterone. But you know what's really bad for your testosterone? Poor sleep and sleep deprivation. A single week of sleeping only 5 hours per night has been seen to reduce testosterone in young healthy men by 10 to 15%. Again, if you don't need to take melatonin, you can sleep fine without it, then yeah, there's no real reason to take it. But if you are having sleep issues and you've already addressed the big factors like artificial light exposure, not eating too close to bed, getting enough exercise and sunlight during the day, then melatonin could in the short term help you improve sleep quality. In conclusion, I think that Andrew Huberman is very conservative and cautious with not recommending melatonin supplementation. Part of it might have to do with the fact that he's a professor in Stanford and he doesn't really want to recommend over-the-counter hormones. However, he's wrong about the fear-mongering about some of the effects of melatonin, namely that it's going to actually make you sleep worse or that it has a permanent negative effect on puberty or testosterone. The Huberman sleep stack ingredients are certainly not backed by a ton of peer-reviewed studies for sleep and they cost significantly more, up to 60 times more than melatonin. Of course, I would always recommend against taking large amounts of melatonin every night for a long time. But episodic small doses of melatonin, there's no evidence that they have any negative effect on your hormones, your sleep quality or overall health. But other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure you click a like, subscribe, notification bell as well. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.